14 a.m. this morning. Uh, I was actually over here setting things up at that time. And uh, this is from uh, the Jerusalem Prayer Team, which is a, a ministry that I'm on their prayer list, or on their, their mailing list. And uh, the leader of this group says, Dear Christian, I just saw a truly staggering statistic. Already this year, there have been nearly 1,000 Islamic terror attacks around the world. Many of them aimed directly at Israel or the Jewish people living abroad. And more than 5,600 people have been killed. And we're only in September at this point. It's heartbreaking to realize the scope of evil motivating the enemies of Israel, and it's a powerful reminder that we must do everything possible to fight and win in the spiritual warfare for the defense of God's chosen people. I think that pinpoints for us one of the key issues that we see as we study the book of Revelation. This kind of terror attack is increasing and during the tribulation period, we're going to see it escalating to heights that it has never been before as the Antichrist comes against the nation of Israel. The church will be out of here at that point, but the nation of Israel is coming under tremendous attack even as God is sending his judgments on the pagans of the world who refuse to acknowledge that he is God and who under the motivation of Satan refuse to spare Israel. Now, of course, the last time we were here in Revelation was August 27th, the revelation of Jesus Christ introducing the judge, part two, that was verses one through eight. And then two weeks ago, Mordecai, man of faith, various passages from Esther by Elder Keith McCoy. And then last week, Patriot's Day Sunday special. So now we are finally getting back to the book of Revelation and I trust it will be a blessing to you. Although we're looking at verses nine and following, I'm going to read the introductory eight verses along with those verses nine and following. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy. So it blesses those who are not able to read. And keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom of God and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the island that was called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day 
And I heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessings on the exposition of this, your word, that you will grant us clarity of understanding, that we will see that you gave this as a revelation, as an unveiling, not as something so hidden that we could not possibly understand it, but something that you yourself have explained to us throughout the scriptures. So, Father, we pray for your blessings upon this study tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm going to do something a little different in terms of our review tonight because I'm going to list specific points for you that you should have written down as you're taking notes because it will help you as you go through the book of Revelation. I'm gonna give it to you by each lesson that we've had so far. Lesson number one was an introduction to prophecy in general and we covered seven basic principles. Number one, we set out the ground rules. How do we compare the Old Testament prophecies, which is one third of the New Test uh, Old Testament, to New Testament prophecies? So we lay out the ground rules. How to compare Old Testament prophecies and New Testament prophecies. Number two, we gave you a de biblical definition of the term mystery. And John uses that here in our text tonight. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. So a mystery is something not revealed in the Old Testament, but something that is now revealed in the New Testament. 
So you're going to see certain mysteries that are given to us in the book of Revelation, which you will not find in the Old Testament, although you will find them in the center of contexts in the Old Testament, though they're not revealed at that point. The third principle that we learned in lesson one was understanding the use of symbols in Revelation. It is a book filled with symbols. The fourth principle that we learned was that literal events expressed by symbols are still literal events. I can't emphasize that too strongly. Literal events expressed by symbols are still literal events. The fifth thing that we covered in lesson one was Old Testament prophecies of both the first and second coming are to be interpreted literally. Whether you find them in the Old Testament or the New Testament, prophecies concerning the first coming were clearly literal. There is no reason to change hermeneutics when we get to prophecies concerning the second coming. They are both to be interpreted literally. The sixth very important principle that we covered in lesson one is that Israel and the church are distinct groups among God's elect. Israel and the church are distinct groups among God's elect, just as there are distinct elect angels. And we never confuse the angels with the church, even though they are called the elect. And we certainly don't confuse angels with Israel, even though they are called elect. And number seven, the rapture is one of the 17 mysteries listed in the New Testament. Therefore, you don't find it in the Old Testament, just like you don't find verse 20, what's expressed in verse 20 of Revelation 1 that we just read in the Old Testament. And then, of course, I gave you nine different Old Testament prophetic passages to read in preparation for the series. And then I gave you the definitions of premillennialism, amillennialism, postmillennialism, and preterism with an explanatory chart and gave you another simplified chart showing where we are in the course of prophetic history. Lesson number two, much more simple than the seven things that I covered there in lesson one. It covered the prophetic signs and gave an overview outline of the entire book of Revelation. And I hope you took it down because the outline of Revelation is very straightforward. A, introduction, chapter one. B, the people on the sin-cursed earth, chapter 2 and chapter 3, which parallels the fourth part of Revelation. C, the key events of things to come, and that's the major section of Revelation, chapters 4 through 20, key events of things to come. And I, I divided it for you into seven sets presenting simultaneous events in heaven and in earth. We got set one, heaven, earth. Set two, heaven, earth. Set three, heaven, earth, and so on which brought us through chapters 4 through chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. Then number D, we saw the people on the new earth. Remember B was the people on the sin-cursed earth. We have the events of Revelation. Then we see people on the new earth. That's chapter 21, 1 through 22, 5. And finally, in parallel to our introduction, we have the conclusion in chapter 22, 6 through 21. That brought us to lesson three. Here are the key things you should have gotten out of lesson three. That was about introducing the judge in the book of Revelation. We discussed nine things in lesson three. Number one, we discussed the title, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of St. John the Divine, although some Bibles have that printed in it. Revelation means to unveil, to reveal. This is an unveiling of Christ, not an unveiling of John. The second thing we discussed was an overview of the relation of the Trinity to the book of Revelation. We see more details as we move through the book, but we saw an overview of the relation of the Trinity to the book of Revelation. We saw that Christ always does everything in obedience to and in compliance with the will of God the Father and in the power of the Holy Spirit and gave many illustrations of that. Number three, the third thing we learned was the purpose of the book of Revelation. The purpose of the book of Revelation is fourfold. One, to teach Christians. Two, to warn Christians. Three, to encourage 
Christians and four, to prepare Christians for the imminent return of Christ. And along with that, and we could make it a fifth point, to motivate Christians to more faithful service. Because if you're preparing for the return of Christ, it will motivate you to more faithful service. The fourth topic we covered in lesson number three was the angelic certification of the book of Revelation. It was a hand-delivered angelic certification. I read that again this, this evening as we went through those opening verses. Then we talked about the key to the book of Revelation. That was number five. The key to the book of Revelation is imminency. It's imminent. It could happen at any moment. If you're not ready when it happens, you're in trouble. Number six, we talked about God's use of people in communicating his word to others. John was given a commission, but that's not just John's job. It is our job as well, and there are many passages in the New Testament that say so. Number seven, we covered John's threefold responsibility in writing the book. Number one, to record what he was being told by the angelic beings throughout the book. Number two, and we read that again this evening, to record the personal verbal testimony of Jesus Christ. Remember, it's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And number three, to give an account of things that he actually saw as on a witness stand under oath. We saw that there were special words there used to charge John with that responsibility. And then number eight, we saw the blessing for reading and obeying the book and the sense of urgency in doing it. It's not something you can put it around about and say, well, I'll do it next week. Rapture might happen before then. There's a sense of urgency in not only reading, but there is a sense of urgency in obeying the book of Revelation. And I want to interject something at this point. This is precisely one of the points that we saw this morning when God put Israel to the test at the beginning of their wilderness experience. Do you remember what we read over in Exodus chapter 15, starting in verse 24? And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, And the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And then these very important words. <clears throat> God provided what they needed. But then listen to these words. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. He put them to the test. Remember, this is their first complaint. They're going to get ten shots at it, and then they're going to die in the wilderness. The book of Revelation is saying the same thing to us in these opening verses. It's a challenge to you to read and obey. It's a test that you're being put to. For there he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them and said, there are four things that God said to them and we're going to see this in Revelation 2. He said, if thou wilt diligently, not haphazardly, not sloppily, not slothfully, not saying, well, this is good enough for government work. If thou shalt diligently, one, hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. As you listen to me, says God. That's what we're called to do here in the book of Revelation. And, two, wilt do that which is right in his sight. There's the matter of doing righteousness, not sitting sullenly and saying, let somebody else do it, but doing righteousness, not sitting in neutral. You say, well, I haven't gone into reverse, but I'm sitting in neutral. God says that is not good enough. You must do that which is right in his sight. Number three, 
and wilt give ear to his commandments. And number four, and keep all his statutes. Israel wanted God's blessing. You want the blessing that comes from reading the book of Revelation. But there is the caveat, reading and obeying. God said, I'm going to bless you as a nation. But I've got four things that I want you to understand you've got to do. If you do these four things, hearken to the voice of the Lord, do that which is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, keep all his statutes, then you get the resulting blessing. Then I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. In other words, if you want the blessing of God, you are required to obey. It's not like those RSVPs that say, the uh, pleasure of your presence at this event is requested. Please RSVP. This is not a request. If you want the blessing of God, it is a requirement, and that's where the book of Revelation begins. Because there are things that we'll see, especially in chapters 2 and 3, which are requirements for you individually and requirements for us corporately as a church if we want to receive the blessings of God. God never gives his extended blessing to children who habitually disobey and rebel. Instead, he kills them. I hope you understand that as you look at these empty pews. And then the ninth thing that we saw in lesson three was the initial audience and the extended application of the book. And we saw that the application falls into three different divisions. Number one, first division, quite clear on the surface, are the seven historic churches to whom the book was actually sent. The second division in the application is the seven different types of character of the churches throughout church history. You will find all seven of these churches, their character expressed through different groups of churches all the way through church history. You can find all seven types of churches in the book of Revelation throughout the entire span of church history. And they're not mutually exclusive. They're all found in every period. But one type predominates that progression in each period of church history, which is the third application of these divisions. The seven different periods of church history from the time that Revelation was written until the rapture. So we can see and study the seven historic churches and what happened to them. But then we can see that the character of those seven churches continues on in multiple churches all the way through church history. And then we can see that in the final analysis, we can look at periods of church history that parallel each of the seven different churches listed in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. That brought us to lesson 4, which was a continuation of introducing the judge in the book of Revelation, and we discussed four specific things. First, we discussed the reason why Revelation begins with grace to you and peace when the entire book is about judgment, and I hope you took some notes on that. Second, we discussed the personal activity of God the Father in his eternal ability and trustworthiness in guaranteeing all of the book. Third, we discuss the phrase, the seven spirits which are before his throne, and the proof that this is a reference to the Holy Spirit, thus showing that all three members of the Trinity are involved in all of the events of the book. That's very important to recognize. Christ is the judge. But all three members of the Trinity, and we'll see this periodically throughout the book of Revelation, all three members of the Trinity 
are involved in fulfilling the events of the book. And then fourth, we talked about the use of the number seven in the book of Revelation, which is used throughout scripture as a symbol for completeness and perfection. And we saw a number of occurrences of that, especially we looked in Revelation where it occurs 54 times in 31 different verses. And so that brings us tonight to verses 9 through 20. So let's begin by looking at verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom of God, excuse me, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's a very interesting introduction here because John is taking a position of humility, and I hope you recognize that as you look at it. John, although he was the beloved disciple, John, although he was the disciple who was not martyred, all the rest of them were martyred, John, who is living into his right 90s, John takes the position of humility. He personally identifies with all of the other Christians. The apostles did have greater divine authority than any other Christians. But it's very interesting to notice that they never lorded it over their other believers. And we see that is what contrasts them with those who claim to be successors for Peter's holy see at Rome. They've, the apostles never lorded it over the other believers like the popes and the prelates later did. That is something that clearly identifies them as distinct from and certainly not from Christ. John first identifies himself as your brother on equal terms with those to whom he writes. Second, it's inter interesting and important to note that the apostles did not escape suffering any more than any other Christians. We talked about suffering before glory this morning, a very important principle. The apostles themselves did not escape suffering any more than other Christians. John was the only one of the disciples who was not martyred, but he was condemned to work the Roman mines on Patmos until he dropped dead. Not a very pleasant way to go out, certainly not quick. We'll be talking more about Patmos in just a moment. And so the second thing that we learn about John in verse 9 is that he identifies as your companion in tribulation. Dear people, we live in a hostile world. Not only is the world not our home, the world is not our friend. It is our enemy. We do so much compromising trying to get along that we try to make the world our friend because we do not like suffering. We talked a lot about that this morning. And so he identifies here in this verse 9 as your companion in tribulation. As we saw this morning, suffering comes before glory, and John alludes to this in the phrase, not only companion tribulation, but and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Suffering comes before glory. Third, although there is coming an earthly, literal, millennial kingdom, which is clearly revealed both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, it's clear from this verse that there is also a mystery aspect of the kingdom that is now present. There is a mystery aspect of the kingdom that is now present. Remember I told you there are 17 mysteries in the New Testament. The mystery aspect of the kingdom is one of those which was not revealed in the Old Testament but is revealed in the New Testament. Now when we get a little farther into the book of John we're going to talk about the mystery aspects of the kingdom now present. We see this in the phrase, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. He was currently their brother and suffering with them in tribulation and in the kingdom and mystery, uh, kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. 
Fourth, let's talk about the island of Patmos for a minute. He says, I was in the Isle of Patmos. Okay, where's Patmos? What's it all about? It's a very small, rocky island. It's not really, really small. I mean, it's 50 square miles. Patmos is 50 square miles. Belonging to a group called the Sporades, which is in the part of the Aegean Sea known as the Icarian Sea. So you think far north into the Aegean Sea and you come to Patmos. The Icarian Sea is that area surrounding Patmos. The Roman government banished their worst criminals here and made them work in the mines. John, as a ringleader of the Christians, was considered such a criminal, but I think he obviously used his time to reach some who were the real dregs and outcasts of society. The Emperor Domitian banished John here in 95 AD. But you know, the Apostle Paul, and I'm sure it was the same with John, though they were different personalities, never compromised their faith. That's why they went through the things that they went through. In fact, we're going to see in just a moment in the uh, very next phrase that it was for his testimony. But the Apostle John, just like Paul in the Philippian jail, would have witnessed to others and others would have come to Christ. We don't have them listed for us here because that's not the point of the book of Revelation. But you know that where John was present, the Spirit of God was present and was effectuating a work for Christ. Did you know, right, as we are speaking at this very moment, there are Christians imprisoned in Saudi Arabia in Iran, in Iraq, in Eritrea, multiple countries in Africa, in China, in North Korea, in certain states in India, and they're imprisoned for their faith in Christ. If you read The Voice of the Martyrs, you find out about them. They come out with a monthly magazine, and I leave copies out here on the table for you. You can get your own subscription. They tell about Christians who are in prison and who are witnessing for their faith and are being tortured every day. I recently saw a six-minute video. Perhaps I'll show it when we come to the Sunday in November, which is designed to pray for persecuted brothers around the world, a video of Richard Wurmbrand and how they would beat him on his feet, on the bottoms of his feet, whenever they caught him praying in his cell. He could hardly walk. They didn't beat him on the rest of his body for the most part. They beat him on the bottom of his feet because of the pain, the crippling pain. They would peek through the cell door, a little peephole, and if they saw him kneeling in prayer, they would drag him out and beat him on the bottom of his feet. Dear friends, that's happening to Christians in Russia today and in the parts of Ukraine where Russia has invaded. That's happening in every communist country in the world. It's happening in Catholic countries in South America where Bible-believing Christians have been imprisoned and are being tortured tonight for their faith. There is nothing special about us, nothing that exempts us from that. John was working with real criminals, people who were murderers, people who had tried assassinations of the emperor, people who were the outcasts and the dregs of society. 
Jesus came not to call the righteous to repentance. Jesus came to call sinners to repentance. And he took one of his prime, we would say most valuable assets on earth at that time because all of the other apostles were dead. And he put him in a location where he would be preaching not to governors and Caesars like Paul had done, but preaching to the worst criminals in the Roman Empire. Do you have the kind of testimony that John had that would give you the privilege of witnessing to people like that? Fifth, it's very clear from the text that John was specifically banished for his vocal Christian testimony because he says, I was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's why they put him there. For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. If you ever walk through our lobby and read anything, you will see those words on the back side of that partition that separates the lobby from the auditorium. For the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. We claim that is what we stand for here in this church. We stand for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. But I wonder if times changed and the government officials knocked at our door, if we would have the boldness and the courage being members of this church to stand for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, if that would mean we would end up like John thrown into a filthy prison doing hard manual labor until we dropped dead surrounded by horrifying and horrible criminals of the worst sort remember that's where this phrase comes from when you read it out there on the partition in the lobby if persecution came on you at that time, would you have been banished back in those days? In other words, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? We get to verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. It's interesting that a trumpet is mentioned here because there are going to be trumpet judgments, but they're not to be confused with this trumpet. It is a voice that sounds like a trumpet, that is a loud, blasting voice as a trumpet. The first phrase, I was in the spirit, is John was in a situation whereby he was seeing things from heaven that he could not see happening on earth. Where John was lifted up above time and space to be able to preview events that were yet to come. But the phrase that confuses most folks as they're reading this passage is, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now we use the phrase the Lord's day to refer to what? Sunday. That's not the way the early Christians used it. They spoke of it as the first day of the week. The structure of the word indicates in the spirit on the Lordian day, or since we're in an apocalyptic piece of literature, in the spirit on the day of the Lord. The book of Revelation is about the day of the Lord. 
That is a phrase that is used continuously throughout the Old Testament to speak of the tribulation period, the day of the Lord. Now we're going to talk about, in a later message, I hope next time, we're going to talk about what is the extent of the day of the Lord as we look at passages in the Old Testament and as we look at passages in the New Testament. But that's a whole message in itself. The Lord of the day, the day of the Lord. John is in the spirit on the day of the Lord and heard behind me a great voice. John is busy looking out in front, but the voice comes from behind. A voice that comes from behind often startles you, often frightens you, often scares you. I suspect if you heard a voice like this, like if you were standing and picking flowers between the tracks on a railroad train, and suddenly you heard a rumble and a huge train horn, you would jump out of your skin because you're nowhere about to be hit. Imagine that experience as John is standing there, I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. So that's the first thing that he heard. First phrase, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. So he has the identity of the speaker, the one who is the Alpha and the Omega is Jesus Christ. The voice that he hears speaking to him is the voice of Jesus Christ. Remember, he was required to write the testimony of Christ. That was one of the three things that he was required to do in this book. And so the first voice that he hears is the voice of Christ. You know, that's the first thing we're required to do as well. We don't hear the voice of the Lord audibly today, but we have the voice of the Lord here. And whenever you hear the word of God proclaimed, you are hearing the voice of Jesus Christ the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the alphabet. That means it encompasses the entire alphabet in Greek. The New Testament was written in Greek. John was in the Isle of Patmos for the word of God. The one who's the Alpha and the Omega is claiming to be the word of God. He is A to Z. He is Alpha to Omega. The entire New Testament is composed of those letters. I am Alpha and Omega. I have the beginning and the ending. That takes you to Genesis. In the beginning, God. The Lord Jesus Christ is not only the Word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ is the Creator because he, in the beginning, is God. And John, in his epistle, reminds us of that. In the beginning was what? The Word, Alpha to Omega. What do we find? The Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, indication of plurality in the Godhead, and the Word was God. 
The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. God breathed into man the breath of life. It was Jesus who breathed into Adam the breath of life. In him was life, and the light was the light of men. Day one of creation. And God said, Let there be light. In Jesus is life, and Jesus is light. And the light was the light of men, and the light shined into the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. John has already written the Gospel of John. He understands the terms that God inspired him to write in the Gospel of John, and suddenly he hears a voice behind him like a trumpet. John never heard such a voice from Jesus while Jesus was teaching the disciples. He saw the anger of Christ at the Pharisees. He saw the anger of Christ at the hypocrites. He saw the wickedness of those who crucified him. But at that point, he heard a different voice. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But he hears a voice now that he recognizes. It is the voice as of a trumpet. And it is a voice that reminds him of what he himself, John, has written in his gospel. A voice that reminds him that there is not only a beginning, but there will be an ending. The voice that is the word, the Alpha to Omega. The beginning to the end. Because the book of Revelation brings us to eternity future just like the book of Genesis begins with eternity past at the moment of creation. Revelation is a very important book in the New Testament, and that is the reason that God gave it last in all of his revelatory gifts when the New Testament was being written. And that's why we find a special curse at the end of the book of Revelation for anyone who adds to the things that are written in this book and to anyone who takes away from the things that are written in this book. It is the final revelation of God to man. And all so-called revelation from that point on, given to various heretics and modern charismatics, is from the world, the flesh, or the devil, or bad pizza. But it's not from God. That's why Revelation is such an important capstone in this book. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And then the commission for the book of Revelation, and what thou seest, write in a book. This is not a request. This was not John, you know, having had a, a bad meal of sea snails or something there on the island of Patmos. It's a command from Christ himself. What thou seest, write in a book. Very dangerous for someone to write in a book that they claim that they've seen a revelation, that they have new insights into Scripture because God told them things that were never revealed before. The mysteries are finished. Everything that God has revealed has been revealed. Though you may not yet understand it, you can get illumination, not revelation. You can get illumination on Scripture, but not new revelation. You can get understanding, but not revelation. He was not only supposed to write it, but he made seven copies. Send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. 
Now, some have suggested that, and this may be the case, that it might have been a circular letter so that it was passed from church to church to church. But when you read about the character of some of the churches and read about the leadership in those churches, it probably would not have made the entire circuit and gotten to all seven churches. Somebody along the way would have said, I don't like this, I'm going to destroy it. Because it condemns some of those seven churches, even as it condemns certain churches today. Send it of the seven churches, which are in Asia. That's Asia Minor. And they list the churches. In fact, chapter 2 and chapter 3 gives us the specific word that is to be given to each of those churches who are to receive this book. Unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Now I have a question. I'd like to see a show of hands on this. I showed a series by Ray Vanderlaan uh, on the seven churches of Asia Minor, where he takes you on site and gives you the history of each one of those churches. Incredible number of insights into understanding the churches of the book of Revelation. How many of you came to that series? Well, some of you who are not raising your hands came to the series. I know you came. If you missed the series, a very bad shame on you because that would help you understand what we're going to see in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. The seven churches are listed here. And I turned, can't believe where time is up, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. He turns around and is expecting to see the one who just talked to him. But the first thing he sees are seven golden candlesticks. And then he sees where the voice came from. In the midst of the seven candlesticks stood one like unto the Son of Man. Did you know that that is the favorite term that Jesus Christ used for himself? If you go through the Gospels and find every reference where Jesus referred to himself, he most often refers to himself as the Son of Man. He emphasizes his humanity. Now, we don't have time to talk about that tonight because we're already 20 after. But why here in the opening chapter of Revelation where Jesus first appears, John sees one who appears like the Son of Man? We'll talk about that, the Lord willing, next week. Clothed with a garment, down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. There's some beautiful symbolism there, but we'll save that for next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. We pray for your blessing on our study tonight, that you will help us to understand the things that we've looked at, that you'll help us to understand better our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we will give an account to him someday. We need to understand that not only is he gentle Jesus, meek and mild, not only is he a lamb, but he is a lion. He is not only our Savior, he is our Lord. And the events that are prophesied in this book will happen because it has been guaranteed by God the Father and the Holy Spirit of God as we have studied.
Father, once again, we thank you for your word and for its power. We pray that you will take it and use, a, use it to motivate us to live for Christ, not merely to warn us, not merely to teach us, not merely to encourage us, but to motivate us to serve Christ with our whole heart and soul and strength and mind. It does give us encouragement because we know you're in charge of the future, but it should motivate us since we do not know the day or the hour that Christ will come back for his church. We do not know the day or the hour of our death. Help us to remember as we get up each morning, I may die today. Help me to make every minute count for Jesus. Let that be our prayer. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.